day today. I'm going to be honest, three of us up here, we were at Kings Island all day yesterday, and we were so tired. <laughs> and from screaming and riding rides all day yesterday. So I'm going to need, you know, through, as we continue on with worship later on, like, I'm going to need a lot of extra help and singing from all of you this morning. So hopefully you guys can help us out with that. Um, you guys can go ahead and grab a seat and you can check out this announcement video. Good morning and welcome to South Creek. I'm Val and I'm the business manager here and we're just so happy that you could join us today. So whether you're here in person or online, just know that you are loved. If you are new or have a prayer request, we have connection cards on the seat backs. 
So you can fill that out and put it in the baskets at the back of the sanctuary, or you can do a digital one on www.southcreek.church. If this is your first time visiting, or if you're just newer, you can fill out a connection card stating that you are new and you can take it back to the Connection Center in the lobby after service and we have a gift there for you to let you know how excited we are that you joined us today. There are a lot of exciting things happening around the church, so you can see some of those items in the bulletin or I'm going to share some of those things with you next. So last week we had a car wash out in our parking lot and it was to raise fund for our friends at Bridges Outreach and the youth did all the car washing with probably some help with some adults. Um, but they raised $500 to give to Bridges Outreach. So great job, guys. The Sunday school class has resumed at 9 a.m. on Sunday mornings. It's being sponsored by our senior adult ministry, but anyone is welcome to join. Speaking of Sam, they are going to have a meeting today after church, and they're going to just be reorganizing, regrouping, and planning some events for the future and you're welcome to join in on that. It's for 60 and older, and lunch will be provided. South Creek shirts and hats are available for purchase right now. The shirts are $9 to $10 each, the hats are $15.50, and if you are doing some volunteering with our Go Team, you can have Go Team put on the back of those shirts. So you can place your orders on our website, www.southcreek.church, and it's just a great way to maybe have a conversation starter with people that are curious about our church. Our last big family event is going to be August the 6th from 6 to 8 p.m. So mark your calendars, you will not want to miss it. The youth is going to do this great service project. They're called Journey Bags, and these bags are gonna have some toiletries and some snacks in them so that you can keep them in your car. And then if you see someone on, on the street or wherever in need, you can have the opportunity to hand them a bag and maybe even have the opportunity to pray with them. So we just thought it'd be a great way to have a connection with the people in our community. So look for a table in the lobby that has those bags on them that you can pick up and take with you and keep in your car so you have that opportunity to do that. So we believe here, in order to grow in your walk with Christ, it's great to volunteer. So we have lots of opportunities, door greeters, in the nursery, South Creek Kids, and we also need some help with some more landscaping that needs done outside. So if you're interested in serving in any of those capacities or anything else that you maybe have some great ideas for, you can fill out a connection card and let us know about that. Again, check out the bulletin for all the opportunities to serve here at the church and know that we so appreciate you and that you are loved. So now will you all stand up and we will continue to worship through song. There's a place. 
not forsaken I am who you say I am You are for me Not against me I am who you say I am Sovereign. 
would you stay standing with me and pray this morning? Lord, thank you so much for your constant guidance and being there for us every single day in the darkness. You give us light in those hard moments and your comfort, your arms wrapped around us helps us get through those times that seem most impossible. So we delight in you, Lord, that you're our hope and you're our praise and we give all that praise to you, Lord. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. Good morning. Yeah, ooh, I feel, I feel good about that good morning back from y'all. Uh, some of y'all have been drinking extra coffee this morning, I think, right? Anyone else? I won't lie. Uh, I've already done one full thing of this. I'm, I'm working through another one right now, so I'm feeling pretty good. I'm feeling kind of feeling loosey-goosey, which feels great. Uh, would you guys just express your appreciation to the praise team? I don't know it's you, but the harmonies this morning. And I felt like I was invited in on the harmonies. While I probably brought some things down a little bit, I felt pretty good uh, in the middle of all that. Hey, before we dive into the message, uh, first of all, uh, this is your opportunity, your invitation to continue in worship with us through uh, responding uh, with generosity through giving. You'll see there's multiple ways to give here at South Creek. You can text any dollar amount to the number on the screen behind me. You can go to our website, southcreek.church, where you can either do a one-time gift or set up a recurring gift, uh, or you can give here in person. There's the boxes at the back. Or again, if you want to uh, think creatively outside the box, I mean, uh, I don't know all the different Bitcoin and Dogecoin, all that sort of stuff, but whatever you feel led to, that is fine. Gold, silver, uh, you name it. Although the message, we're going to talk about some weirdness with gold and silver later, so maybe not. But uh, again, thank you for your ongoing generosity and faithfulness to the mission of this church. It's because of you that we're getting to do incredible things. Now, I just want to highlight real quick before uh, we go on, I think it did get highlighted in the, at least part of it got highlighted in the video too, but uh, I've just been so grateful to see uh, a, a concerted effort towards being even more intentional about loving our neighbors and getting beyond our walls. And I in particular want to say thank you to Katie Rigsby and Lindsay Butts who are kind of leading our community outreach team through many different awesome things. I just want to celebrate for a second. First of all, uh, we did a car wash last week for Bridges Outreach. The, the student ministry helped kind of lead on that effort too. And the idea was to raise money for Bridges Outreach students uh, for kind of their back to school school supplies. We raised $500, which is so awesome, in just a few hours. So uh, that's awesome. And then we did a, a baby bottle drive for one of our uh, local uh, ministry uh, partners called the Pregnancy Resource Center. Uh, and uh, through just the baby bottle things that y'all did, uh, we raised uh, $1,302.04. So can we just praise God for generosity like that? I love when stuff like that happens. So all right, I do need an extra little drink here for a minute. So if you got it, you can, this is your moment. We can all lift it together. I do feel like that should be part of our, our service, right? We all just kind of lift the cup together. You know, it's not the same as, you know, the cup that we have a communion, but it brings life to me at least. All right, picture this. It's 2014. It is a beautiful October day in Anderson, Indiana. Now, some of you have been to Anderson, you're like, beautiful in Anderson. Uh, I don't know. Inside of Madison Park Church of God, it's October 18th. And there you see two young people in love. You picture one who looks sort of like this, except for at the time they're wearing a medium-sized t-shirt, and they don't have so many gray hairs. On that day, I'll never forget as I stood across from my beautiful wife, Hunter, holding hands in front of friends and family who had came near and far to watch us become one, to see us enter into a relationship of commitment and promise. I remember us sharing our vows when we promised that regardless of what was going on around us, we would be committed to one another. Whether it was sickness, whether it was 
in financial need or not. We committed that we would love one another, serve one another, and be all in on what God had for our life, no matter what. And I am so grateful that I have been blessed with a wonderful wife, a wonderful partner who has agreed to those. I mean, that poor woman, literally a month after we said our vows, I got two bacterial infections uh, that were not the most wonderful thing. It got tested quickly. We had our moments where, 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 where we're sitting there and we're saying, God, I'm looking at the checkbook and I'm not sure how things are going to align. And we have seen how God has provided over and over again. You see, vows, promises, or covenants will always be tested and always be pushed to the limit. And yet, there's something so beautiful about it. It's the reason why I love when I get the chance to do weddings. I love to see people make these commitments because I've said this before and I stand by this. We live in a culture and in a time that is allergic to commitment, We are constantly looking for ways to bail out of things. Some of us, I'll admit it, you sometimes have an ongoing list of excuses for why you can't go to something, why you can't do something. Some of us have a habitual issue of saying yes to one thing and then something better comes along and you switch to that, right? We live in a world where that feels like there's just this unsteadiness Because of it. And yet I believe that as followers of Jesus, that we are called to be people of commitment, of loyalty, of steadfastness. And we should do this because we believe in a God of promises. We believe in a God who not only makes promises, but keeps promises. If you haven't been with us the last few uh, weeks, we are in the midst of a series called The Life of Moses. Moses is this incredible uh, figure, this incredible historical figure that we find in uh, the Bible. And in particular, we find him in the Old Testament. And we've been primarily hanging out in the book of Exodus. And uh, in Exodus, we, we find that Moses has this unique story where he, uh, through, through lots of twists and turns, finds himself being used by God to lead the Israelite people, God's people, out of enslavement in Egypt. And he finds himself wandering in the desert for a little while and seeing God continue to provide over and over again for him and the people. Last week in particular, we kind of focused on this first desert season where literally the people had just seen God miraculously make these plagues happen, miraculously seen the Red Seas part, and they were still sort of like, what if we die of starvation? What if we don't have water? And even in the midst of their complaining, their grumbling, and their distrust of a very faithful God who had proven himself already over and over again, God continued to provide for them. And they made this journey from being enslaved in Egypt to this uh, desert and this mountain called Sinai. Now today, we're going to pick up there. And today, what we're going to focus in on, what we're going to talk about, is we're going to talk about covenants and commandments. Now, those are two things that I think oftentimes our language, at least today, probably either doesn't have a good understanding of what those words mean, or we have a big like, ooh, I don't like that. That sounds a little churchy. That might even sound a little judgy. I'm not sure how I feel about those words. And so we're going to talk about these today. And my hope is that we get a better understanding because language matters, right? But I fear sometimes that we allow words that the world, that culture, that time has given a wrong connotation to, and we just miss out on some of the things that God wants to speak to us because we're like, ooh, that sounds like this, and I don't want to be like this. You feel me? So let's talk about this. We're going to start first with talking about covenants. And I, I began talking about this idea of my wife and I uh, 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 sharing our vows because marriage is a covenantial relationship. Now, a, a covenant, just in, in sort of an easy definition, is just this. Covenants are arrangements between two parties involving mutual obligation. They are conditional and they typically involve promises. Now, 
That's why sometimes we, we, we talk about the idea of, of God's promises. Now, the interesting thing is just this, though, right? A promise can be made, and there may not be uh, uh, much of mutual obligation, right? Sometimes you might make a promise to your kid, and like a fool, you forgot to put a condition on it, right? You make the promise that we're going to Disney World. When that was your moment, we were going if you do X, Y, and Z, right? It's a parenting hack for you right there. Make sure there's some sort of condition in there, an escape clause for you, and also maybe a way to get them to do stuff. But a promise, what? It can be a one-way promise, right? There's sometimes where there are promises that, that, that someone makes to us that there's no said expectation on our end, right? Now, we all know this, right? A promise is only as good as the one who makes the promise, right? We've all experienced that before in our lives, right? Someone makes a promise to us and it doesn't come through. Could have been a parent, a teacher, a coach, a spouse, a, a friend, and that's difficult, right? Now, a covenant, though, the idea is that there is mutual investment in the agreement, in the promise. Now, think about any wedding you've gone to, right? Now, I understand people, people write their own vows now and all that stuff, which is really cool. It's great. Um, that's fine. But, but one of the things why I even encourage couples when they write them, sometimes that we, we go through some more sort of traditional ones, is one of the beautiful things is that you agree to the same things, you both have equal standing in it. When my wife and I got married, we didn't stand up there and I didn't say, uh, uh, I will remain faithful to you, and my wife omitted that part. We didn't stand up there and, and I didn't make her say, I will be faithful to you, or I, I will be with you through sickness and health. I didn't say like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut that one out, right? We come into it with an equal idea that both of us are agreeing to these same terms. Now, when we think about covenant with God, we have to recognize this, though. Here's what's sort of beautiful. In a marriage, the idea is that you are coming in with equal investment, equal risk, equal trust, hopefully. In this, I'm just going to be real with you, which is incredible news for all of us. God is coming in with the higher amount of investment and risk involved. In fact, oftentimes, when I think about it, it would be fun someday to write a story about a relationship that's happening where there is one person who always keeps their end of the deal and another person who never does. One person who is always forgiving and always faithful and one person who never is. And it would be this beautiful story of a toxic relationship that all of us would be like, get out of the relationship. What are you doing, you idiot? And the story would just be our relationship with God. If we had some sort of relationship like that, most of us would give God the advice of like, man, like, get out of that. They are bad news. They keep hurting you. They keep uh, not living up to what they said they were going to do. And yet the beauty of God and his covenants are just this, and I hope if you fall asleep you don't miss this, is God makes promises to us for us. And here's what the incredible thing is. He constantly is finding little clauses, little opportunities to say, even when you mess up, even when you go against it, I am still going to give you opportunity to join back into the promises. Even when you mess it up. And that's, I hope that's good news you hear this morning, that you can't mess it up forever. You can this, uh, you know, you, you, you can, but God will continually be giving you opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. In fact, God will call you more often than those people looking to see if you want to check out your extended car warranty. He is going to continue to give you opportunity after opportunity. And the reason why is because he loves you. I hope you hear this this morning too. God does not need you. He does not need you. And some of you are like, ouch. Why are we here then? Because God wants you. That's the beauty of this relationship. God does not need us in the relationship. That's this equation. That's the weird piece. God does not need you. God wants you. And that is an incredible reality if you can start understanding it, start believing it, and start living in it. That God doesn't need you, he wants you. And when we talk about covenant, when we talk about this promised relationship, God is inviting us into this, not because he needs something from us, but because he wants something from us. 
And not like in a weird way, like someone's got these ulterior motives. He wants to be in relationship with us because he loves us. Plain and simple. Nothing less, nothing more. All right. I'm, I'm, I told you, I drank a lot of coffee this morning. I'm fired up. Uh, if you have a Bible this morning, you can open up to Exodus chapter 19. If you don't have a Bible with you, uh, it'll be up on the screen. I'm reading from the NIV translation, if that's helpful. And we're going to bounce around some different places uh, this morning. So, uh, Exodus chapter 19, starting in verse 1. On the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they had set out from Rebim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and they camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Now again, just a reminder, here's kind of what's happening. They, 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 they go through these plagues, they have the Passover, Red Sea's parted, then they get into the desert. At first, they don't have water that they can drink. God provides, makes the water drinkable. Then they don't have food. They're, they're thinking, we're just going to starve to death. We're going to die out here. God provides both manna, which is this bread from heaven, and quail for them to eat. Exactly what they need, because God always provides just enough. Then, once again, they're out of water. They don't know what to do. And once again, God provides water. Then after that, as if it has not been enough, they are uh, attacked by the Amalekites. And if you remember, we ended last week talking about how, how, how Moses raised his arms and Aaron and Hur came beside him. And as long as the arms were lifted, the Israelites had victory. They have been through a ton, right? And they make it to this mountain. Now, I have to wonder, I have to think for the, for the Israelite people, if they're thinking like, this is where we're coming? Seriously? Goodness gracious. I feel like this is like one of those Facebook marketplace things where the picture online looks a little bit different than the reality. But okay. And so here's what happens in the story, starting in verse 3. When Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, he said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Though these are the words that you are to speak to the Israelites. Now, uh, back up history in case, in case we're, we're a little uh, unsure about this. So, if we go back to the book of Genesis, the very first book, God makes a covenant relationship first with uh, 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 Abraham tells him that he is going to use his family to redeem and restore the relationship with all people. This covenant then is, is kind of confirmed again with, with, with uh, 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 Jacob who becomes Israel. And then again, God is continuing to invite his people into a covenant promised relationship. Now, it is crazy because again, thus far, the Israelites track record to keep their end of the bargain is not very good. But that's the beauty, right? God doesn't look at our past faults when he invites us into a new future. Why? Because he loves us. Because he believes in the fact that if we could just grasp that love, that just maybe our hearts would be transformed and then the world would be transformed. But you notice that. He he says this there's 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 very much a, a reality to Uh, This isn't just, here's my promise to you. There's a little bit of skin in the game for them. If you obey me fully and you keep my covenant, then I will do this. Now, can I be real with you all for a second? Most of us understand this, but we don't like it. We understand God's ideas here, but we don't like them. And and here's what I mean by that. We wouldn't say that, but I'll be honest. I'll I'll be honest. I'm, I'm not the best person in the world. I want God to be giving me everything I want, everything I need. I want him to forgive me. I want him to love me without me having any investment or skin in the game. 
Now, again, most of you are like, oh, pastor, you're just, you're just saying that. Or no, we don't really think that. But it's kind of true, right? We have a, a, a selfish bent to ourselves as humans, right? And, and if you don't believe it, when is the last time that you have spent uh, with a baby? Babies are selfish, right? They don't care what time it is in the middle of the night. They want what they want when they want it. There's not reasoning with them, right? Which is frustrating. Sometimes it's like, could you just tell me what you want? But we want relationship with God where we get all of the perks, but we have none of the commitment. To, to use maybe the terms that the kids would use, right? We, we, we kind of want to be friends with benefits with God, which I know is kind of a weird thing to say. But it's true. We want all of the benefits of a relationship with him without any of the commitment. We want God to bless us without having to be a blessing to others. We want God to be generous to us without us being generous to others. We want God to forgive us without having to forgive others. And that's not the way it works. You see, if we want to experience the whole picture of what God has for us, with what Jesus says when he says, I have came to give you life and life more abundantly, there is a bit of investment that we must make too. And it's funny though how we can get mad about the idea of the investment that we have to make. You know, I've been thinking about sports lately. My, my, my son Gideon, he's our oldest and he's five, and he, he, he's getting to that phase where he is just like all about sports. Uh, he, he's excited he's going to do soccer again after doing it this spring. He's going to do it in the fall. Uh, it did my heart good. Uh, I, I had bedtime with him earlier this week and he asked me, Daddy, can we, can we watch Michael Jordan videos? Which, how am I supposed to say no to that? And then we watched Space Jam the next morning, the original, the OG one. And uh, I love it. And it's fun, though, because he's also starting to learn some of the rules to the game, right? Now, if, if you were to look in this room right here, there is a basketball court, right? If you didn't notice that, yes, the, there's a basketball court in here. And, and there are lines on the ground that tell you certain sort of boundary points in the game, right? Right? Now, unless it was incredibly uh, smaller than normal or incredibly bigger than normal, for the most part, everyone who's going to step foot in here, if you're going to play a game of basketball, would be fine with saying these are the boundary markers for when the game, uh, when the ball is inbounds and when the ball is out of bounds, right? Because it's a pretty easy thing to understand that there are some levels of boundaries to keep the game going properly, in covenant, in many ways, it's easy to think about it as that too. That there are boundary markers to keep the game going. In many ways, for some of us who, who would be like, ah, I don't want to get into that, it would be like wanting to play the game of basketball. It'd be like, I want to play, but I just, can we not do the rules and can we not have the boundary markers? That wouldn't work, right? It would look silly. It wouldn't make sense. That's a little bit of what covenant is. All right, we've got to continue on, though. Uh, verse uh, 7 and 8. So Moses went back, and he summoned the elders and the people, and he set before them all the words the Lord commanded to speak. Then the people all responded together, saying, We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to God. All right, so right, God gives this proposition. You obey me fully. You keep my, command, my, my covenant fully, this promised relationship. I'm going to take care of you. Things are going to be great. That's a great deal, right? I mean, they would be pretty stupid to say no, right? Now, I still kind of wonder if some of them are like behind their back, like, yes, Lord, of course we will. But they agree to it. They say yes. And, and here, here's what I want you to hear about covenant that I hope is clear some things up for you. God invites us into covenant not to control us, but to connect with us. He doesn't invite us into this covenant relationship so he can like control us and, and do sort of like an in sync, bye, 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 uh, you know, uh, puppeting sort of thing. He's not trying to do that. He's not trying to control us. He's trying to connect with us. You know, the story of the Bible, the story of God's relationship with his creation, with his children, with his people is not one of trying to control us, but to connect with us. And it's a story of trying to restore and redeem a broken relationship. If you go back to the beginning of scripture, before sin and shame enters the world into the, the picture of, of God's creation, we see that God was in a beautiful, loving, connected, perfect relationship 
with us. And his goal ever since then has been to restore and redeem that relationship. And so when God gives these covenants throughout Scripture, it's not to control the people, it is to connect with them. But he recognizes that oftentimes he has to put in place things like commandments, which we'll get to in a moment, to help stay in bounds of the covenant. But again, covenants only work when both parties are faithful. They only work if both parties agree to these things and actually follow through. Now we continue in verse 9. The Lord said to Moses, I'm, co- I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord uh, what the people had said. Now we see this, right? So God decides he is going to show his presence. Again, in the Garden of Eden, they were able to be in this beautiful uh, present relationship. And so God begins to uh, uh, want to show his presence, but what they begin to see very quickly, uh, and and we're not going to read all these different parts of Exodus because that would take a long time, is that God's holiness, his set-apartness is so strong and so difficult, and the sin and the brokenness of the people is so strong that it's hard for that presence to completely coexist. I mean, we have stories in Scripture where there are people who, 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 who had not properly gotten themselves clean and ready to go in the presence of God, and they quite literally died, which I know is sort of weird and hard to understand. And if you want to have further conversation about that, let's do that over a cup of coffee sometime. But we see that these things aren't really working out. And so God decides that what he is going to do, what he wants to do, is to begin to give commandments to the people to help them stay in a more holy, set-apart place and to be able to be in a holy place where he can reconnect with them. Now, I have this with me this morning. In a moment, we're going to read and talk uh, just briefly about uh, what we refer to as the Ten Commandments. When I was a little boy in Sunday school uh, in Greenville, Michigan at the First Church of God, uh, I had a lady who was our teacher once named Rosie, and she was a super great lady. In fact, if she's watching online, I know you watch every once in a while, Rosie. Hello. Um, she had us, which is crazy when I think back about it. She, she's a little bit crazy, and she, she would agree with that. Uh, she decided to take a group of, I think, probably second or third graders, uh, and they gave us these sort of hot um, uh, metal wood burner things, and, and we wrote out the Ten Commandments on our own little thing. I still have them for fun. And, uh, and, and I oftentimes uh, uh, think back to this uh, practice. You know, this is sort of a fun little weird thing, but it, it has been formative to me. And, and, and I think about it being formative just because uh, I, I think about in, in our culture and our climate today, the Ten Commandments are a very controversial thing, right? For some, they are a symbol of, of, of maybe a, a, a God of the Old Testament that's different than the God that we find in the New Testament in Jesus, which, by the way, is not true at all. That's a different sermon for a different day. For some, uh, it's a sign of of sort of like religious forces trying to get into government buildings and all sorts of things. It it has sort of a bad rap. And some people are like, the Ten Commandments, we need to follow every bit of it completely to the letter of law. We need to be Ten Commandment Christians. And for others, we're like, throw it out. And so today, let's talk a little bit about what do we as followers of Jesus do with these? Now, again, I think it's helpful to understand this as a definition for commandments. Commandments are rules or guidelines that help you live in a way that keeps you in the covenant. They're not rules just made to see like, okay, let's see how high they can jump. This is going to be pretty funny. They are things that were put out to help you. Now, think about it this way. And some of us aren't going to like this analogy because we want to be adults and think we're smarter than what we really are. But I have rules in my house for my children, right? And they might not always understand them. They may not always agree with them. But for the most part, I'm not a mean dad. I don't have rules in there just to watch them squirm. I mean, I've done that before. It's kind of fun. You all have done it if you have kids, admit it. Or there's rules where you just say a certain show doesn't work on your TV or, or for a while you tell them that ice cream is spicy so they don't want it. I mean, we've all been there. We're among friends. 
It's a pro tip. But for the most part, we we have rules, we have guidelines in our house that are set not to limit our children, but to help them stay in a good place, to keep them safe, to keep them healthy, to continue for them to grow into who God created them to be. Now, to go back to our sports analogy, right? I understand sometimes sports games, they, they, they change the rules and all that sort of stuff. But for the most part, there's a lot of, lot of rules that stay in sports that stay for a long time. And you know what? M- maybe people might argue whether or not a certain uh, rule, uh, maybe a certain foul, a certain call was right or not. But for the most part, people tend to say, oh, I get it. We have to have these rules in this game to keep the integrity of the game. We have to have these rules in the game to keep things flowing, to keep things good. Right? Now, I used to love, uh, when, when I was a kid, I remember one of my favorite video games to play was on the Nintendo 64, which hands down to me is the greatest video game system of all time. And they had a game called NFL Blitz, which was wonderful because in, you know, good Christian love, after the play, you could like drop kick or power bomb your opponent, which felt great. So even if your friend scored a touchdown against you, you still got to get a little bit of retribution. Very normal Christ-like things, I understand. But we understand that that's just a fictitious sort of game, you know? None of us would watch, uh, you know, the Colts play and, and proudly see the Colts score a touchdown and then the other team drop kick them and be like, good form, man. Don't call a penalty, right? We understand that there are rules because the reality is without rules, there's not order. And God is a God of order, a God of peace, a God of harmony. And again, these commandments are all here with the idea to keep the covenant healthy and good. Again, most of us, for the most part, if we've gotten married before and we say our vows, most of us are like, gosh, do I really have to remain faithful only to you? (sighs) That seems a little bit much of an ask. No, for the most part we get, no, you have to have some of those things. Do I really have to be with you regardless of your health? No, most of us understand that we do these things because that's what love calls for and that's what a good relationship calls for. All right, I'm going to run through the Ten Commandments real quick. In, in, a, in a side note, there are about 52 other commands that are in Exodus that we're not going to get into today because a lot of them have to do with this idea of creating a, a temple or a tent of meeting or a tabernacle, sort of a holy space where the presence of God could be here on earth. But, but, but here's a refresher. Maybe we haven't read them in a while. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Now again, he's defining who he is. He's reminding them again, hey, you might not like all of this list, but remember who I am and what I've done for you. And he says this one, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, for us today, that's an easy one to be like, oh, I can hit that one easy peasy. Like, I'm not going to mix, you know, Buddha with Jesus and all that sort of stuff. Easy peasy. In that culture, in that time, yes, there were oftentimes a, a lot of uh, uh, religions. There were more religions than not that, that, that tended to have more than one God or seek more than one God. That's one of the crazy things about the Jewish faith and the Christian faith is, is that we are a monotheistic uh, 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 sort of group, which is just a fancy word if you want to impress your friends who say it, it's a religion that believes in only one God, only serves one God. There you go, something new to learn. But he's saying, you shall have no other gods before me, just me, me and you, we're exclusive as the kids would say. Pretty easy. The next one he goes on, it says, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth below or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations to those who love me and keep my commandments. Now we're going to walk into that generational piece uh, in, in a little while. But again, the whole idea is don't make a statue and then worship it. That's, that's basically really what this is. Now you'd think like that seems pretty easy. These shouldn't be hard. If anyone breaks these rules, it's going to be a while. But hold your coffee and we'll, we'll get there. Then he goes on and says, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord or, or the Lord, take the Lord's name in vain. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Again, it's this idea of God being holy, set apart, 
please don't use uh, uh, his name in a cursing manner. Then he goes and he says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male or female servant nor your animals nor any foreigners residing in your town. For on the sixth day the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord has blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, we're going to have a a message coming up soon talking more about this idea of Sabbath. But I would honestly say I think this might be the most broken commandment of any commandments that we see in the Ten, uh, more often than not on a consistent basis, because we live in a culture that stinks at resting. We just do. Jesus, in fact, said that that Sabbath wasn't made for God, it was made for man. Pretty smart carpenter, if you ask me. Uh, But we're going to talk about that more another time. But again, the whole idea, keeping the Sabbath holy isn't just, when I grew up, God bless them, but a lot of my, my Sunday school teachers just said, keeping the Sabbath holy just means going to church. And that is good, that is important. But the idea of Sabbath rest is this idea of, of completely slowing down, allowing yourselves to your body to rest, because quite literally from a scientific standpoint, you need that. But it's also about this idea of allowing God to give you rest and peace in the midst of a busy and stressful life and world. All right. Kids, listen to this one. Honor your father and your mother so that they may live long in the land of the Lord your God is giving you. Pretty easy there. Then then we go on a string of ones that, 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 that seem a little bit easier to probably not do for the most part. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor and you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or his donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Now, uh, covet is just this, this word really for, for sort of having a, a jealous sort of uh, attitude or, or thoughts where, where, where you see, you know, someone just got that brand new car and you just kind of lingerly are like, oh, I want that. And we get it because... When we tend to covet other things, what we truly are doing at the root of it all is neglecting the gifts that God has given us. Now, again, commandments are not made to condemn you, but to keep you from condemnation. Commandments are not made to condemn you, but to keep you from condemnation. Now, again, are those difficult to follow in some ways? Yes. But God puts those out here. And by the way, as a follower of Jesus, Jesus would affirm the Ten Commandments. There's nothing in there where he's like, hey, guys, I'm going to be honest. Uh, You can let go of two and three, keep four and five. You know, it's crazy. We look at the Old Testament sometimes where we're like, the book of Leviticus, how weird is that? Am I right? And it kind of is, but Jesus never did that. Jesus doesn't look at the Old Testament the way that we do. We sometimes look at the Old Testament and be like, that's outdated, that's bad. Jesus says, no, 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 I'm the fulfillment of that, but I'm not negating all of it. And so these are still things that we are called uh, to do. We're still uh, to keep only one true God. We're not to serve other ones. We're not supposed to make images and idols that we worship. Now, granted, we can have symbols that help represent those, but none of us today are getting up here and we're, we're, we're hopefully not you know, praying to the cross. We're praying and we are praying to the one true God. We're praying to Jesus, right? So the commandments are still important. But again, the whole idea of them is that God's commandments help us stay in the covenants. Yeah, I don't know about you, but in, in healthy relationships, typically, it's good to have communication and to have boundaries, right? Now, I understand those can go too far, but, but every once in a while, right, you, you reestablish some of those things. You might say, hey, I don't really love when you do this, or hey, I would really rather you not spend time with that person. And if it's a good, healthy relationship, you typically stay in those commandments, right? Those, those, those asks of the other person, right? Because your goal is to keep the covenant healthy, to keep the relationship healthy. That it would be better to deal with the fact of not doing some of the things that you naturally might want to do, but be in right standing with God. 
See, so often we trade uh, instant gratification to our emotions, to our desires, and we sacrifice long-term promises that God has for us. Now, the scripture continues on in verse 18. It says this, When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpets and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself. We will listen. But do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Don't be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Now again, Moses is teaching us, he's reminding the people, don't be afraid of God's presence. And that's something that still should be true today for us. Don't be afraid of God's presence. You know, what I found is oftentimes today, we're not afraid of God's presence from a standpoint like they were, where they're like, I see some dark clouds and all that sort of stuff, and I'm worried that I'm going to die there. Most of us, if we're honest, we're afraid of God's presence because we carry a lot of shame. Most of us are afraid of God's presence because we are sitting there thinking, if he really knew what I thought, if he really knew what happened to me, or if he really knew what I did, then I would really be in trouble. You know, we, we, we kind of think of our relationship with God like a parent, right? Right? If they can't find me, if they can't, uh, <laughs> if my, my, my son Silas loves to do this, when he gets in trouble, he's a runner. He runs and hides. And my favorite thing is since he's two and a half, oftentimes he's a terrible hider. So you'll find him in a room just sort of like holding a book in front of his face. <laughs> and we can laugh at that, right? Because we recognize he's not going to be able to run from his father. And yet the truth is many of us do the same thing. Many of us do the same thing with our Heavenly Father. We in some ways hide from God with just a book holding over our face, hoping he'll never see our sin and our shame. You know what the sad reality is, something I've learned? Is we hide from God thinking that we're going to experience punishment and retribution and more shame. And the reality is, the longer that we stay away from him, It's like we are staying in Egypt. It's like we're staying enslaved by that sin and that shame. We fear that we're going to fess up and we're going to be destroyed. When the truth is, is that when we finally run home to our Father, we won't be destroyed, we'll be delivered. And many of us today, I think that's our story. There's many of us who are afraid to just go home to our Father. And some of us just need the courage, we need the nudge to do that. Scripture says there is no fear in love. Fear has to do with punishment. Scripture says God is love. So some of us today need to just learn that lesson. Don't be afraid of God's presence. Don't be afraid of it. And we continue on because I've got to land this plane. When the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites this, you have seen for yourselves that I have spoken to you from heaven. Do not make any gods to be alongside of me. Don't make for yourself gods of silver and gold. Uh, Make an altar to me and sacrifice on it burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, your sheep and your goats and your cattle. Wherever I cause my name to be honored, I will come to you and bless you. Now, we don't have enough time today to get into this story, but I remember a few years back when I uh, was at another church and I was a youth pastor, I began to hear kids say to me, and I didn't understand it at first, you done messed up, A.A. Ron. Anyone ever heard this before, seen the video? It's okay. We're, you're among sinner friends. There's a video out there where a teacher mispronounces names, and one of them that they mispronounce is they, they call out a name in a class, and they say, is A.A. Ron here? So all the kids love to tell that story. Well, if you remember, God used Moses and his brother Aaron, and while God was talking with Moses up on Mount Sinai, kind of figuring out how he was going to be able to uh, build this tent of meeting, this area where he could dwell among the people and the people could dwell among him. While the people were afraid of the presence of God, they thought Moses was never going to come back down. And though, so they found Aaron 
and they asked Aaron to take the gold and silver that they had and melt it down and make a golden calf. Now, there's two things that are hilarious about this to me. One, literally, we just read, right? Big thing. Don't make any graven images. Don't worship any other gods. He even reiterates it, right? Like, I I feel like God could already sort of see it in the eyes. We've done this before where we've seen a kid where they're they're like eyeing the stupid thing that they shouldn't do. And you even kind of warn them and you know they're still going to do it. Like, hey, whatever you do, don't jump off of this. And they're almost like, oh, so you're saying jump off of this. And that's what's happening here. It's also hilarious and kind of ironic, too, that if you remember at the very beginning of this series, we talked about how the Israelite people tend to be people of shepherding, of lambs, of sheep, of rams, right? And the Israelites were people of cattle, of cows. They make an image of something that, honestly, their oppressors, the Israelites, that would have been something they would have made. It's this reminder that for whatever reason, so often, even when we are freed, we sometimes want to turn back around to the things that hurt us more. It's why people sometimes continue to go back to toxic relationships because we just can't help ourselves. But so they make this image, right? And Moses comes down and he gets mad. In fact, he takes the tablets to the eyes and he breaks them. And he's frustrated. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about this thing later. But what's crazy is even after the Israelites very quickly break their covenants, God decides that he'll restore the covenant and he'll continue to have relationship with them. And this is where we're going to end today in chapter 34. God and Moses kind of sort things out. In fact, Moses goes to bat for the people. God is kind of ready to be like, ah, I think I just want to wipe them out. This is ridiculous. And Moses goes to bat for them. He puts himself on the line. And then God says this about himself. It says, he passed in front of Moses. This is God passing in front of Moses. And he says this about himself. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation. And we'll end there, right? Because none of that is weird. Right? We love the first part, right? It's a beautiful thing. We're going to talk more about uh, this later, this, this thing that uh, next week we're going to talk about this thing called the Shema, which is this prayer that the Jewish people pray. But we love that, right? Yes, he's compassionate. He's gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. And that is completely true. But we're like, what do we do with this other part? Now, this is one of those times where uh, we, we have to be reminded that we are reading a ancient text that is translated into a different language than what it was written in. And so sometimes translations kind of get a little bit murky, where sometimes things sound a little bit more harsh, a little bit more difficult than they are. But let's talk about this real quick. So when he talks about he won't leave the guilty unpunished, that all these generational things, are, are, are you trying to say that God is just like a, mm, a mean God? What this really is saying, in maybe a little bit more soft language that helps us understand this, is God is a God of justice. You know what I've found in my life? I always want God to be a God of justice when I have been wronged. And I always want God to be a God of grace when I'm in the wrong. When I've messed up, I want God to forgive me. When others mess up, I want God to punish them. And what God is trying to say here, in many ways, is that he is a God of justice. He's a God of his own word. And so if he makes a promise, if he makes a commandment, he will make sure that they have to come through. Now, here's the great news, right? We know, living on this side of the cross, that God came once and for all to pay the debt that we never could. That there was punishment waiting for us because of our sin and our brokenness that is no longer there for us because of Jesus. Praise God. But what about this fourth generation thing? He's not saying here that God punishes people in that my sins automatically become the other sins. What he is trying to say this is that sins have consequences. Hear this, friends. God will forgive your sins, but it does not mean that your sin will come without consequence. 
And I don't say that to bum you out, but it's a reality. If you have sin and junk in your lives, your children 100% have the opportunity to not live out those things. But the reality is, is that there will be consequence from your sin in the lives of others. Period. We are connected people. We try to feel like we're just these individual people who, who all can do our own things, and, 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 and I get it. We have a beautiful uh, society that we live in where, where you can make yourself from something else. But the reality is we are deeply connected. Whether you want to admit it or not, you all have, even if you grew up in a great family, you have family wounds. You have generational things that you are dealing with right or wrong. Now, the other thing is you have some generational blessings, things that that people did before in your life are blessing over to you now. That's really good news. But here's the thing. The tension of the story of the Bible is this, that there's no amount of commandments, no amount of covenants that could keep the people connected to God. This only could happen with God putting skin in the game, with a new king with a new Passover lamb, with a better Moses who would lead us out of the enslavement in Egypt. This could only happen with Jesus. We're going to talk more about um, kind of wrapping a bow on the legacy of the Israelite people and uh, in in this story in particular, in the legacy of Moses. But I hope you just hear this as we're going to close out with one last song. All of God's promises are found in following Jesus. Every single promise that he has made in scripture that is made for us is found in Jesus. Either it's already been fulfilled through him or it is something that is coming when he comes back. And the great thing is regardless of our stories, regardless of our background, regardless of our sin, regardless of our shame, regardless of the sin and shame of our family before us, every single one of us are invited to experience this new life. Every single one of us. And here's the great thing that you should know. He already knows you're going to mess it up. He already knows that he's getting the raw end of the deal. And he doesn't care. Do you know why? Because he doesn't need you. He wants you. And he loves you. Would you guys stand as we're going to pray and sing one last song? Father God, thank you so much for the fact that you invite us into a covenantal relationship. And God, even though they're difficult sometimes, God, I'm thankful for the commandments you give us, God. God, I'm an idiot sometimes. You know that. And God, I'm grateful for the fact that sometimes you spell things out simply for us. You help give us sort of guidelines, boundary markers, guardrails that God aren't meant to control us but are help us connect to you. God, this morning I pray that as we sing this last song, that you would remind us of your immense love for us, your great desire to be with us, and the extreme loving ways that you have gone to make a way for us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Love that song. And the song speaks to the idea of Jesus being the vision for really our soul just experiencing all that it was created to experience. And again, as you leave today, I, I hope you recognize that though sometimes people will say following Jesus is following a list of rules, it's really not. It's following a guide, it's following a savior, it's following a king, it's following the one true better Moses who is leading you out of the slavery of sin and shame and leading you to a new promised land, a world where you are whole in him, where you experience life and life more abundantly, where you are no longer enslaved, but you are free and you are free indeed. Friends, let me pray a prayer of blessing as we leave. I'm going to be in the lobby afterwards. If we've never met, I would love to just connect with you today. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the fact that you are a God who is compassionate, that you are slow to anger and you are abounding in love, and that God, you forgive our sin, our shame, our wickedness, and you don't desire to see any of us perish, but you desire to be in loving, unified, abiding relationship with us. So God, as we leave this place, Father, I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit, God, in a powerful way to just remind us of your presence and that we shouldn't be afraid of your presence, but we should run to your presence. And that God, as we leave this place, God, as we go into our neighborhoods, into our workplaces, our schools, every place that you give us opportunity to have influence and presence, that Father God, we would be people who would return those same things that you give us, that we would be compassionate, that we would be gracious, that we would be slow to anger, and that we would be abounding in love and be people of forgiveness as forgiven people. So God, give us opportunities today, tomorrow, and the next day, and forevermore to love our neighbors as ourselves and to love you in new and deeper and beautiful ways. Father, remind us that you're with us for us and that you love us. I pray all of these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, it's great to be with y'all. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday. Sam has their meeting right after service.